Good afternoon. Today we're at the Public Library of Cincinnati and Hamilton County, and it is Tuesday, January the 12th, 2016. We are fortunate to have Brian Powers handling the camera, and I am Jim Griever. Mark Wayne Wall was drafted into the United States Army in 1968 on November the 7th, and he is a combat Vietnam veteran who is with us today. Mark, I'd like to start off by asking you simply that could you describe the uh, mood of the country at the time that you were drafted? Those were volatile years. Oh, wow. Uh, 1968, I was a senior at Miami University in Oxford, Ohio, and I'd applied to and been accepted to law school at the University of Cincinnati. I well remember the a speech that Lyndon Johnson gave when he announced that he was no longer going to run for President of the United States. And Bobby Kennedy had gotten into the race, and Eugene McCarthy had uh, opposed him, and even though uh, uh, Johnson had won the New Hampshire primary, uh, McCarthy had done very well. And he decided that he wasn't going to run for President again, and I had taken a physics exam that night, and I came home, turned on the TV, I'm eating beans and weenies, and he said, oh, and we're no longer going away with draft deferments for graduate students. Uh -huh. And my heart sunk, because it already had a pre-induction physical. And uh, I pretty much sealed it that I knew that, because I was rated A1, that I was going to be drafted. So uh, the, uh, that was a year also, uh, you know, there, uh, Bobby Kennedy was shot out in Los Angeles. Martin Luther King was killed, and uh, the war protests against the Vietnam War were really gaining strength. That was the year of the Tet Offensive. That was the year that Walter Cronkite came back and famously said that it didn't look like we were winning the war. And the mood of the country was uh, very much divided, and uh, the presidential election that year uh, uh, proved that out as well. Uh, Nixon ran on a program that he had. a. Uh, plan to, to end the Vietnam War and bring the, bring the troops home. Mm -hmm. uh, so there was a uh, it was a very very volatile time. Anybody anybody tells me today about all these things that are going on, I said, you didn't live through 1968. I don't think there was ever any year like it. Not in my lifetime. Certainly agree with that. Yeah. What was the mood of the country in Middletown? Was there uh, demonstrations or activities? It was a pretty patriotic community in general. Yeah, it was, and it was, uh, uh, you know, I had worked in the steel mill, Armco Steel Mill in the summertime. My father had been an employee there, and I worked with many World War II and Korean War veterans. And they were, they were basically uh, very supportive of the country and the president. Uh, they were what uh, Nixon referred to as the silent majority. So in our community, uh, there was very much, they were very supportive of the, of, the, uh, of the fight in Vietnam. They thought we were there for the right reasons. Uh, these are men who had fought against Nazis. These are men who had fought the communists in, in North Korea. These are the people who believed that uh, Khrushchev was serious when he beat, beat his uh, shoe on the table and told him that his grandchildren would bury ours. So they, were, they thought there was a real danger there. Uh, they believed in the domino theory that was being presented at the time, that if you let these small countries fall, eventually it's going to be. Uh, nobody knew uh, what China was, was, was like, uh, particularly under Mia, uh, Mao Zedong, what they were going to do. And we'd fought that horrible wall, a war to a stalemate in, in Korea, or as it was referred to at the time, I think, a police action. But uh, yeah, it was. Uh, uh, in, in my community, they were very supportive of the war and very uh, supportive of veterans in general. Let's uh, describe what your training was like. Where'd you go and what'd you do? All right. Well, let me start with, with you know, how I ended up getting drafted to begin with. Okay. Uh, 1966, uh, I was home uh, working in the steel mill at Armco in the metal products division. Armco had a you know, they made the famous Armco guardrail there, but they also had a product called Benwall. And they had a contract with the government to supply these ones where they would make revetments to park planes and helicopters in Vietnam. And I was working seven days a week, 
10 hours a day on a one-time day shift, second-time night shift in the, uh, in the steel mill, putting these together hmm. for a shipment. I was a car loader. They all came out in railroad cars and had government inspector in the plant. Uh, I went home one day, opened the mail, and Miami University had gone to computerized grades at the time for the first time, and they had printed those ones where they just it would print on the outside and come through on copy paper. I'd open it up and it said, you've been suspended. And then I, was, I took a look and it was courses that I hadn't taken. They were basically elementary education. Well, I knew what it was. There was a girl that, over there named Karen Wall that lived in Camden. I ended up being in the, with her brother in the, at Fort Dix, New Jersey in basic training. So I thought, well, I'll, 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 you know, I'll square this thing away. I was working uh, uh, day turn, so I said, oh, next week I'll go over to the university and see if I can't square this away. It wasn't three days later I got a note from the draft board that I had to go down for my pre-induction physical. So I went down to the, I went over to Miami University and I found out that there was only two people who knew how to get into computers. And they were both on vacation. So I actually went on a pre-induction physical to, to, in 1966, that if I didn't get this squared away, draft board said, it's your problem, you got to square it up. And so I rode down, and half, on, on, the, on the bus was half the football team from Miami University. And I'm talking about fellas. I'm talking about Bruce Maddy and Kenny Root, who are friends of mine. And they all came down and laughed on the way back because they, weren't, because they all had shoulder problems and knee problems, and uh, they had things of that nature where they, did, they, were, uh, they didn't uh, get the same classification of A1. Was that physical done in Cincinnati? Yeah, yeah, yeah physical was done. Yeah, the federal office building. A, uh, a John Weld building down here in Cincinnati. Right. So anyway, I, I finally have to go back and get it all squared away, but I know now that I'm, I've already taken my pre-induction physical and I'm classified as A1. So when Lyndon Johnson came on and said, that's it, there's no more draft deferments, uh, I was working in the steel mill again trying to save up the money for a law school. And uh, I went down to the draft board and they told me, you're gonna go in October or November, Mark. And I said, okay. And it just so happens that two of the members of that board were attorneys, local attorneys, that I always uh, didn't have very kind words for them after. <laughs> but they were just doing their job. Uh, so anyway, I uh, uh, end up uh, uh, going to the mill, quitting, taking my money out of the bank, and going to California with a friend of mine named Tom Woods. And I was living in California, having a great time living in Garden Grove. Matter of fact, I stayed with a friend of mine who was in the uh, air wing in the Marine Corps at El Toro Air Force Base. And I actually had applied for a job up at Douglas Aircraft and uh, I was thinking about staying out there. And uh, my mother called me and told me a draft notice had came. And so I, it was October, I flew back to Cincinnati uh, and uh, uh, got ready to go. And on Nixon was running and he knew that Ohio was important to him at the time. Mm -hmm. And he was taking a train from Cincinnati, I believe to either Columbus or Toledo, and he stopped in Middletown. And my parents lived about five blocks from where the train station was. So I walked over and I was a political science major as well, mm -hmm. always intent on being a lawyer. And I went over and I always remember going over and watching him stand on the back of the train with his wife Pat, her head laying on his shoulder. There might have been 35, 40 people there, cold rainy day in November, typical for Ohio, and he gave a stock five minute speech or whatever, and I always paid attention. He had a plan to, to end the Vietnam War. And that was just a couple of days before the election. Uh, but anyway, I reported on the, uh, uh, the 7th. I did vote that, that, that election. Uh, reported on the 7th, uh, took a bus down here to the Cincinnati, John Weld Center. They kept me over a day because I'd had kidney problems before had a doctor look at me and put us up at the old Metropol Hotel down here. And then they, because I was a day later, they put, a, they put me in charge of making sure everybody got on the airplane to go to Fort Dix. If I had gone the night before, if I had gone the day before with a group I came down here with, I'd have gone to Fort Knox, so, which was a lot closer to home. But anyway, uh, the, uh, uh, at the induction, uh, one thing I remember was there was a fellow there wearing women's underwear. And they were drafting for the Marine Corps at the time. And let me tell you something, you talk to Marines, the last thing they want is a draftee among them, because you have to join their corps. 
And so he, so he went. They pulled him out of line. He's going to the Marine Corps. And then they had us count off one, two, three, and all three stepped forward, and they got drafted in the United States Marine Corps. And the rest of us went into the United States Army. Uh, went to Fort Dix, New Jersey. It was in the winter time. Uh, went through basic training, uh, which was uh, very good training uh, overall at the time for the Army. Uh, but the first night I was there, I learned one thing. You don't take the first bunk by the door because they pulled me out of that. I hadn't been there for four hours because it was fly all night long. They gave you uniforms. You walk over there. They put me on KP duty for 12 hours because a lot of the returning Vietnam veterans they were bringing over the top through Alaska over the top, bringing them into New Jersey rather than down the West Coast. And uh, so I was uh, doing KP and cleaning up in a... In a uh, uh, kitchen for them. Uh, did pretty did Where pretty. Did you go on R and R, New York or Philadelphia? Where I uh, went, took a train up to New York and then back, and then we got Christmas. So I got to go home for Christmas. Yeah. And uh, uh, yeah, it was uh, we got very good training there. One thing about it though, they, you know, because what was going on, people just, you know, when 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 you got your orders for Fort Polk, Louisiana, they called it Tigerland. Either you were going to the United States Infantry to Vietnam. So they posted the orders at 10 o'clock at night. And they had armed guards there stationed with you. You had to go back and get your, get your gear together. You had two hours to get it together. They put you on a plane with Southern Airlines. They flew you down to Alexandria, uh, Louisiana, uh, to go into, the, go into the Army. And that was Fort Polk. And Fort Polk was an older Polk. You had the wooden barracks. The barracks at uh, Fort Dix were brick and concrete and well manicured. And uh, I'd done very well. I was in probably the best shape of my life. I'd done a, a PT, run a measured mile, and combat boots in a little over six minutes, and wasn't you know could do all the push-ups you wanted and do all the chin-ups you wanted and everything else. I was in very good shape. I weighed about 190 pounds. When I come back from Vietnam, I weighed 148, uh, and it wasn't uh, you know you you know, just you know, the conditions there with your food and every water and everything else were terrible. But anyway. The training at Fort Polk, Louisiana was just outstanding because you had veterans there who had been actually been in combat and were teaching about booby traps, plus the people that, that you were you know, becoming a light weapons infantryman. I was qualified on everything from the, now we'd done basic training with the M14. In Fort Polk, it was with the M16. Qualified on the M16, the uh, ni Model 1911, uh, 45, uh, M60 machine gun, M79 grenade launcher. Uh, M uh, M1 uh, 50 caliber uh, machine gun as well. Uh, plus they, you know, you were taught uh, grenades and you were uh, smokes and how to put up your uh, 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 claymore mines and, and the rest of it. And uh, we had a pretty tough commander while we were there, and we were doing. We were, you ran everywhere. You didn't walk anywhere. You ran everywhere. And so when that training was up, uh, I had a five day leave for reporting to. Uh, Fort Lewis, Washington, and I spent two days in New Orleans, and I never paid for a meal or a drink while I was there, if you were in uniform. Greatest people in the world, as opposed to what awaited us in San Francisco. And I'll talk about when we came back. Uh, but anyway, I reported on time, went to Fort Lewis, uh, Washington, and uh, flew out. The uh, military had contract with what was a company called Flying Tiger at the time, which was cargo. And that's about how much you, that's how you felt when you flew over there. But we flew over through Alaska down to uh, uh, Japan, refueled in Japan, and then flew into Cameron Bay. And I tell the story when I, when I stepped off the plane, the first thing I saw was one of those revetments of Benwall from Armco with their famous triangle on it. <laughs> you probably made <laughs> Yeah, I don't know if I made about it. I sure, sure had something to do with shipping it there. So right there where you're waiting on the tarmac at Cameron Bay, they came around and you got your orders for, and a couple of the guys I'd gone through AIT with, one, one went to the 9th Infantry Division, and because they were one of the first divisions pulled out, he only did six months tour there. But uh, I got an order from 199th Light Infantry uh, Supply Company, and I thought, hey, this is great, they're going to make a supply clerk out of me. So they put you on a uh, C-140, no seat, you stand up and takes off and lands and at uh, Thompson at Air Base close by Long Bend and they go to the brigade main gate of the 199th Light Infantry. And I was assigned to Alpha Company, 3rd Battalion, 7th Infantry Regiment. And 
you did three days of, of training there, and you were assigned your weapon and you're assigned uh, your field gear there, and you only got one set of uniform when you went out to the field because when you come back out, they just had other laundries and they just gave you a new, not a uniform, it was all worn out. They didn't care what your size was or anything else. Uh, but uh, anyway, we uh, trucked down through Saigon, uh, down to uh, the Delta area, uh, to the first fire base was Fire Base uh, Stephanie, and it was a dry season. Fire Base Stephanie, if you uh, if you see pictures of Vietnam, particularly in the in the Delta region, there's water, there's rice paddies all around. But they build their uh, on the high ground is where they put their uh, Cemetery. So the fire base is actually around a cemetery. And I was assigned to a company. There was, I think, seven of us went down, and we all went to the same platoon. Now, that would exceed your normal rotation, which means there had been some combat and they'd lost some people, either wounded or killed. And indeed, that had been the, been the fact, because there were uh, four other fellows that had come in there just two days before us. So they had lost almost 10 people there in, in action. And uh, but anyway, I get signed to the first platoon. You're the new guy. So they signed me to a squad. Uh, and the fellow that I came in with, uh, uh, Michael Vermillion from Virginia, and uh, Blues Powell from Birmingham, Alabama, uh, Pat uh, uh, O'Donnell from West Covina, California, and Jerry McGee from uh, Lincoln, Nebraska, was basically our squad. And I never forget the first time I walked outside the, the gate because it was a dry season. You take a step and the dust had come up and just settled down. And Blues Pals wearing a pair of rose-colored, heart-shaped sunglasses. On the back of his helmet it says, LBJ sucks. And he turns on a radio, and I'll never forget the song was, Won't You Marry Me, Bill, by the Fifth Dimension. So we're supposed to patrol around the perimeter and make sure there's nothing there. So we go out, this little village is there, so we pull up, and every little, every little hamlet as a place where you can, where the locals gather to drink tea or whatever. So we set up there, like we're going to walk around the whole thing and go out to all this buddy stuff. And Blues gets on the phone and every 15 minutes calls in and tells them where we're at. <laughs> and we sat there and drank tea and ate French pastry. <laughs> and then headed on back and I'm thinking, what have I got myself into here? Well, uh, next day, uh, Bravo Company, uh, because what would happen is you'd always have one company out of the battalion. Uh, basically, you had your uh, Alpha, Bravo, and Charlie, or your, your Echo company was your was smaller company for your uh, uh, for uh, observation and uh, uh, I'm trying to think of the word reconnaissance. Mm -hmm. And you had a, uh, uh, of course, a mortar company, which would generally they just make that. Uh, Delta Company, Echo was a, was a, rec was a recon. Uh, there'd always be one uh, company in at the fire base for production, so you had a bunker that you were assigned to. That's where you slept. You slept on sandbags. If you ever saw the movie Platoon, that's, that's what it looked like. Uh, so you're not sleeping in cots or anything else. You're just sleeping on sandbags, or if you got a hammock strung up, you have that. Uh, so anyway, they came in. They said, well, Bravo companies pinned down out here in a place called the Pineapples. This was a huge pineapple plantation. And they said, they didn't call my name, they just said Cherry, which means you're the new guy there, you're walking point. And they handed me a, a mask with just eye slits in it that you put around your head in the back. And instead of just a flak jacket, it's a flak apron that went all the way down your ankles. And I looked at the guy and he says, you're walking point. He said, there's booby traps in there from the French <laughs> Indochina War. And so we get off the planes, they come in, you can see that you saw the Cobra helicopters up there and they're firing and it's all along the, a uh, canal with nip palms on it. And I get out and I'm wearing this thing and it's muddy. And you, it's, you take a step and you do this. Now it's 95 degrees, humidity's 90. 92 percent and going like this and I got it maybe about 30 yards and I just took it off and I laid it down there because everybody else is walking 30 yards behind me because that's all you wear is like a cow catcher and I said I'd rather die of heat exhaustion I'd rather die being shot to death than die of heat exhaustion 
when we came down there, I ended up getting a little, you know, a few few rounds fired or whatever, not a whole lot, not a whole lot, and things dottled down. Once you bring in the helicopters and the artillery, the Viet Cong would generally back off a little bit. So anyway, that was my first experience under fire. And, uh, Did you the, lose any companions? That day? No, not that day. No, no. Uh, but uh, the... Uh, uh, How would you describe that fire? Is it intense or sporadic? It was more sporadic because we were coming in. Bravo Company was really under thing. We were coming in to give them back up and sort of try to outflank the folks. Uh, but that was just sporadic, not a whole lot. There were, uh, I, we figured there might have been just a couple of them shooting at us. And you can tell them because they had... Their tracer, our tracers were red, their tracers were greens. First time I saw green tracers. And that's when I knew that, you know, you know, you can, you know somebody's shooting at you when you want the tracers grow your head. Sure. Uh, but anyway, the, uh, we're out on patrol again. And uh, one of the things I remember is uh, when the rainy season started, because you're just bone tired, and I lay you down in this rice paddy, you know, you just you sleep on your helmet and you got a poncho liner and you got covering you up and it started raining. And you're so tired anyway, you just laid there in the rain. What woke me up was when the water got up to the level of my mouth, I started gurgling. And this is just awful stuff. But I'll never forget, that we got up and moved out that morning, and you went past a little hut. And when you spent some time over there, you'd, you'd, you'd realize that in these little village and hamlets, you'd see old men, old women, young kids, and women, you just didn't see any young men. They were fighting from one side or the other. And I'll never forget the, the typical, you know, he was wearing his, he was getting his water buffalo ready to go out since the rain had started to plow. And he had this uh, goatee, the white hair of the old man. And he just looked at us as we walked past. And it was just like, gee, I wish you'd go away. I'm just, you know, life is so hard, you know, bringing in a rice crop. You know, our sons are dying, you know, that sort of thing. You just, yeah, you get a feeling when the way someone looks at you. And uh, that's one of the things I never forgot. Uh, anyway, we went back, and uh, one of the fellows in our, in our platoon, or Delvin Benner, he won the Silver Star. And I found out that what had happened is, you know, before I got there, what we were replacements for was that uh, they had been ambushed, and four or five people had been caught up front. One of them was Delvin, and he laid there because they pulled back. They couldn't get up. They couldn't, you know, they, the, the, the company was right at dusk, and uh, Delvin laid up there, and they, were, they came out at night and when they were going to get him or whatever, and he threw a couple of grenades, and he was able to get away. But uh, the one person, the, one, the other, other two were, or three were dead. They found them, but the one they, they didn't find was the medic, and a guy from Bravo Company comes over. And he tells us, so, well, you know, we found the medic. And they had uh, taken his hand, they said, with wire, and tied him up, stuck sticks in his ear, put his eyes out, and taken his testicles off and shoved them in his mouth. And left him there, knowing that he'd be found to send a message to us. And you know, when you hear this, you know that there are no prisoners going to be taken down here. You know, we weren't, they're not going to take you 400 miles to North Vietnam. If they, get a, if they get a hold of you, you don't have any value to them other whatever to have a little fun with. So you knew, and I've learned very early on, this is a, this is a kill or be killed situation. And it really just really, you could watch it in the faces of those people who knew them, uh, the, who knew that medic. Because, you know, the one thing you're dependent upon in combat, if you're there, you want to have a good medic. And they're the bravest of the brave. They're the ones that go out and stand up during fire and go out to help people. And uh, that really just, you could just see that it really angered them. Uh, one too long after that that they moved us out of that fire base up to, uh, uh, all the one, up to a uh, place at uh, Kanjuk. Uh, if you ever saw the national... Uh, geographic one about uh, brothers in war, that was, their big battle was at Kanjuk. Uh, and it was, we knew we were going to have a you know, tough time here. Uh, we'd taken over this fire base from the uh, 9th Infantry. 
and uh, I think it was part of the process of them pulling out of there. Uh, but the rainy season was there. You couldn't stay out. It was always so wet, but three days at a time. Uh, one particular operation uh, that I remember, they, uh, we trucked out. We got off the trucks, and what you would do is you would wait until dusk, you know, because you, you had to figure, you know, because, you know, the Delta's popular. You know, half the people in Vietnam lived in the, in the Fourth Corps down the Delta, because this is where this is the fertile ground. Uh, the Mekong Delta, this is where they grew their rice. This is where you know, families could be. You had to figure somebody's always watching you. And so what we would do is we would figure out where we we're going to set up, and usually we'd set up around a, around a little hamlet somewhere at night. And we'd wait till the sun went down to move in there. And uh, what you'd do is you'd, somebody would go up to the, to the little hut there, and they all had little places in, inside of them. Uh, made out of brick or stone where they would get into. It's like their own bomb shelter inside. And, you know, you don't speak the language, so you kick open the door, you pull the pin on a hand grenade, and they know what's going on. You know, you, you kill me, you're going to die too. So they all scramble, get in there, and you'd set up around it. And invariably, around 9 or 10 o'clock, there would be some VC coming. And it seemed like every other night we were in a firefight down there. And one of the scariest moments, the first of them, I was, something had happened, and I was walking last instead of first. And they stumbled, and they were moving into around this hamlet, and they opened up on it. And I'm stuck out in a rice paddy by myself. Now, I'm scared to move. I just squatted down. I'm scared to move because there's bullets, you know, going up, you know, not necessarily over the head, but up in front of you. And I'm afraid if I moved up my own, you know, I'm liable to be killed by friendly fire by my own, you know, which happens on occasion, uh, by, by my own things. And that was just a, you know, just a scary moment where you, where you just sat there for about 30 minutes till things stopped, and then you say, do I yell? <laughs> do I stand up and walk? <laughs> do I lay down in this mud all night, or what do you do? And uh, so anyway, you, you come up there, and of course they were, uh, you know, that's what I'm saying. That was typical of fighting down in the Delta, because the second six months we went up north up to War Zone D, which was the jungle, a logging area and much different type of fighting, because there you were up against the NDA, down there you were up against the Viet Cong. Uh, one of the other, you know, you, you can't pinpoint a lot, and a lot of them would just be a few shots and that'd be it. Uh, we had a, uh, the, our unit had a kill ratio of 66 to 1, which was, you know, an awful lot. Uh, one of the other nights that I remember was, uh, we were doing that same thing. We were out getting ready to move in, sitting out here, took a break, waiting, you know, to, we picked out where we were going to set up that night for the ambush. And uh, they opened up on us from a, what we call a nip line along a canal. So we jumped on the other side, and I was carrying ammo for the machine gunner at that time. Down the Delta, despite these things where you got the bandoliers about it, we carried it in a can because you couldn't let it get wet or get dirty or anything. It doesn't do you any good then. We gun jams. And I just soon, no sooner flipped it, flipped it open than the bullet comes in and hits the can from the other side. So all of a sudden now we're jumping from one side <laughs> to another. And we called in a, a Cobra helicopter because we're just, you know, it's just, you know, what do you, what do, you do? What side of the dike do you run on? Because you're right out in the wide open. And they had us. Uh, and it was just about dark. And one of them idiot VC from the thing fired at that helicopter. And the helicopter pilot's cosign was Stogie 3 3. And he went in and leveled that village. Just indiscriminately. And we laid there that night, you heard the screams. And you saw the, the, the old guy with a little lantern moving along. And you could hear the screams of the people that had been hit. And then we got to go in the next morning, and there's the dead water buffalo. And little kid, I pick up this little girl, and I just had a, uh, there's a opening line of uh, Stephen Crane's, the uh, open boat, where these two guys trying to survive in this boat, you know, they're, are so intent, they're bailing water and looking down, they're not looking up, they could, the line was, uh, none knew the color of the sky. And three months ago, I get a note from a guy that was with us, Mike Vermeer, I went in with, and he said, 
And I hadn't had contact with Mike in 30 years. He stopped in to see me. His wife uh, grew up down the river down here in Mount Madison and said, I woke up last night. He said, I had this picture of you holding this little girl saying, none is the color of the sky. He said, I looked it up. It was Stephen Crane. And he just remembered that. You know? And I think that's part of the other thing that goes along with you know, certain things stick in your mind. But anyway, it was a horrible situation, you know, what happened there with Stogie 33. And, you know, because we're on the ground and we, and, we, and we see it and we see the little kids and you see the things, just how destructive, you know, what is often called collateral damage in a war. Mm -hmm. And so we had to wait there among these villagers. You can imagine how they felt about us. Uh, but here comes a guy from the, from the headquarters to give the mayor of the little hamlet money for the damage that's been done. And, we had to stay there until they, there was security for them when they showed up to do this because they didn't know what's going to happen. And there's instances like that. Uh, one of them uh, I mentioned here, a fellow I came in with was Pat O'Donnell. And we'd gotten a new battalion commander. And uh, Pat uh, had, uh, that's Pat standing there with a toothbrush. And uh, Pat carried, at that time, carried an M79 grenade launcher. And Pat had told uh, uh, the new battalion commander, it said, because we were right next to the village of Kanjuk. And he had told Pat, uh, or he had told us to make sure that, you know, the, the little kids who come through the wire, you know, just shine your shoes or shine your boots or do something, run for you. Uh, Mama San would do your uh, uh, clothes for you. Uh, down the Delta, We'd wear these. We'd take an old uh, shirt and take the sleeves. Mama saw to make them into pockets to put your. Uh, uh, you can see it in one of the other photographs here. Put pockets where you'd put your uh, magazines in or M79 grenade launchers because you're only out for three days, so you're not carrying a real big pack. You put your food or whatever in your side pockets. It's a lot more convenient. Plus, it also gave you some protection across your chest. So they'd come in and do those things and cut your hair. They'd come through the wire, take the shortcut. And so he said, you got to stop that. So Pat fires a uh, CA, uh, C, uh, tear gas grenade out there and accidentally hits this kid. Mm. And it's bugged him for years. And we had a reunion that I'll talk about it later. Yeah, yeah, well, he didn't know that at the time, but he just saw the, the come and take the kid off and everything. So. Uh, Pat now lives in Vietnam because he had to, he had to go back there and uh, find out whether the child died or not. And he did find out the child had died. And uh, I stayed in contact with Pat. And uh, he ended up uh, working or volunteering at an orphanage there. And then he went back a second time. He met a young Vietnamese girl there and ended up marrying the Vietnamese girl. He now lives in Vietnam. And. Uh, but that's you know how the, those things always stay with you. And Pat was very volatile. He went into the army as a private, and six years later came out of the serve as a private. Because Pat told me, I said, "What happened?" He said, "Well, you know how I am on orders." <laughs> he said, "I had an officer when I was stationed over in Germany, and they they took every all my stripes away." And I said, well, "Okay." So, well, yeah, that's all right. He said, "I I took the." Uh, everybody knew the guy deserved it, is what he said, so I just got a, you know, I didn't get court-martialed or anything, I just got this. Uh, but anyway, those are the things, like I say, that, that sort of haunt you. It isn't the, uh, the danger when you get around and you, and you talk, to, talk to veterans who remember those things. Uh, one of the other things about, uh, about down in the Delta is they had these things called Eagle Flights. And we would go out uh, where you'd make two or three, and that's the reason I got an air medal with an oak leaf cluster. I was working on my third, which means you'd make over 50 combat assaults by helicopter. But anyway, they would, uh, you'd make two or three landings in a day, and the whole battalion would be in the air. So if somebody made contact, you know, if you got pinned down, you could bring in another company to, to help you out. And uh, so uh, we're out, uh, and uh, I served under the first African American general which is Frederick Davidson, uh, to uh, be authority over a combined uh, group of individuals, Frederick Davidson. And uh, he was from the, uh, 
George Patton School because he wore a pair of ivory handled pistols. He did. Uh, but we loved him. You know how some commanders you love? Because when we'd be out on these eagle flights, he'd be up in the air too. And he'd stop, he'd, he'd just about make a point there. And he brought the mail with him, brought you cold Coca Cola when you're out there. And we used to, when you in those rice paddies, sometimes you get sucked down in that mud. We'd tie an extra set of shoestrings around and put them around up here because you'd have to pull your leg out and you'd be going that slow and across the open ground. Uh, but one of the ones we went on, now we're walking point, and we have a Chuhoi scout with us by this time, a man very responsible for me being alive here today. Uh, I always wonder what happened to him. I'm sure he was treated absolutely horribly by the I think His name was Win Von Chin. Chin was, I think, 36 years old when we met him. Uh, he was a Chuhoi scout. That's, and I think, his, uh, spelled N G U Y E N, Von, V O N, Chin, C H E I N. We just called him Chin. Spoke very little English. He was a captured a Viet Cong. He'd been a Viet Cong for nine years. He told us that his rate of pay was $2 a month. He had five children. Uh, he made sergeant's pay in the Army, which was, I think, around $325 is what we got paid. And uh, so his wife was tickled to death when he got that amount of money. Uh, but uh, Chen, of course, was very familiar with booby traps. So we're out, uh, and I'm walking point, and I'm trying to get as much information. But by this time, he'd been with us a while, trying to get as much information. He taught me how to, uh, uh, he said always, uh, when you come into these bunker complexes, stay on the paths, don't go off of them. They figure the GIs won't walk on the pass because that's what's booby trap, but that's not what we booby trap. He taught you how to, uh, you take your rifle, the point of it, point it down along the ground a little bit that high off to catch the trip wire because trip wires are not tight, they're slack. So when you step, when you, when you step with it on your foot or your leg, you, you mo your, your weight's going forward so it's too late. If you, under, if you understand what I'm saying, if you make it tight, you're gonna feel it maybe and stop. If it isn't tight, if it's loose, it'll, it'll pull out. Uh, so anyway, we're coming up. It's, I think, our second flight of the day, and they put us down. And when you walk up, and there's these little signs that says, M-I-N on it, men, for the locals with skull and crossbones to let you know that there's mines in there. That means also there's a, a bunker complex in there. So we come up there, and I'm standing there with Chen. We had a brand new, I had five second lieutenants while I was there. And half the time we were out there, uh, we didn't. Uh, we were we had a sergeant run us. And one bad operation I'll talk about. We had a 19-year-old Spec 4 with us running the running the platoon. And Roland Merson at our reunion, I asked him. I said, Roland, I said, gee, we just we just seemed like we couldn't keep a lieutenant. And was always either losing them for one reason or another. And he said, you know what? You guys operated better without it. <laughs> <laughs> but this fellow, and I felt so bad. And I think he was invited. I know he was from Washington State. And you know, I was a college graduate. And, you know, and of course, he'd gone to OCS school. And he was out there. And this was his first operation out in the field. He hadn't been there with us a week. And we come up there. I'm walking point, And I stop because I can see the bunkers down there. And Chen walks up to me and he says, Whoa, no go, no go, no go, no go. I said, OK, Chen, whatever you say. If you say no go, I'll no go. And Lieutenant Doc come up and he says, and I was spec for said, well, what's, what's the problem? And I said, well, Chin here says no go. They're not there. He said, they've left. That's what he's saying. And he said, this thing's just full of mines all over the place. And he says, that's what he tells you is, you know, sometimes you know, they have these places out there where they use when they need them. And I said, they've got their own little maps of them, but when they leave, they set extra booby traps. He said, no, no, we're not going down there. And he says, I'm ordering you to go. And, I, you know, and I'm saying, sir, I says, this little guy here planted these things for nine months. I said, I know what they can do to you. I've seen it already. I'm not going down there. And he walked maybe 20 feet. He was going to lead his way because that's what I'm sure they teach him. You know, mm -hmm. thing. And he had a... Mine lost, lost, lost part of his left, uh, left leg there, like that. Uh, the Viet Cong would, you know, most of the time they set up these, like we call them tin can grenades or whatever. So there we are, you know, the poor guy's laying there. And it knocked a couple, wounded a couple other people as well. 
so anyway, we, we pull back out into the open area and dust him off. And of course, the battalion commander comes back on and says, get back in there. So <laughs> we take what I proposed to the second lieutenant before he did that. And I says, well, why don't we just throw some M79 grenades down there and make some explosions and do that and then go out to the side anyway. So he orders us back in there. So we go back in there and that's what we do. We fire some down there. So then we start out to the, to the uh, right and we're walking in elephant grass, which is about up to here. And Pat O'Donnell starts screaming and I'm maybe seven or eight feet from Pat because I'm still walking forward and he's walking just back to my rear. And I look over and there's a grenade on a stick with a pin about halfway out. Mm. And I froze. But a young man by the name of Monty Brandt from Texas didn't. He bent down, took a shoelace out of his boot. And I'm standing there, Pat's still screaming, trying to call him down. Because if it goes off, it gets Pat and it gets me too. And I don't want Pat to panic, so I'm not, I'm not edging away, but I'm not doing anything either. But Monty Brandt did. He goes up, bends down, puts that pin back in that grenade, wraps a shoe lace around it so, it so the handle doesn't go off or whatever, and picks it up. Now that's bravery. Yeah. Now Monty ended up getting wooed over there. He went, they, they recruited him because he was, he was a young man that, you know, been out in the woods. He, he went to the uh, recon, then he got shot up pretty bad. Uh, uh, but anyway, they uh, uh, were down in the Delta was, uh, uh, we'd actually be in these 10 huts, but you had, as a matter of fact, these corrugated things with sandbags on for a protection you sleep in. But you were always wet. Your feet were always wet. It was just, it was just you know, just, just horrible uh, most of the time down there. Uh, one of the other operations we had that I remember was, uh, I call it the, the, we went on a village seal. Uh, and uh, where we went out on an operation at night and uh, to seal around this, this village. And while they were, because they knew that there was Viet Cong activity in there. So we're laying there right along the canal and you hear something and you know, all of a sudden you can hear somebody down in the water. So we open up, but you're shooting almost down at them. So we shoot up and we're shooting down there at them. And uh, of course, they send me down to check him out. And uh, so I crawl down, literally crawl down in the mud down there and I find out and of course he's, he's dead or dying. And I know that he had, I'm taking his belt off him, what material he had. And I sort of notice he looks a little different. He's a little tall. And I mean, he's almost as tall as I am. Well, that's not, this isn't, you know, thing. What's a Chinese officer? Mm. China, I found out years later when I read it, they were pretty active in the war. They had a lot of support troops up in North, they also sent him down. And that's what the papers were. They were his officer, he was a, he was a Chinese officer. And he had a nine millimeter uh, uh, Chai Com, because it was actually made, most of the weapons the Viet Cong had and the NVA had were made in Czechoslovakia or Russia, but this was made Chinese, had to start on and everything else. So I kept that, and like an idiot, I traded it for a shotgun when I walked point. Because <laughs> I, I could have I brought, that, brought that gun home for me, which is another thing I'll talk about, the weapons caches. Uh, but, uh, you know, the other times you'd see these, we'd go out on these things and you'd watch the, uh, these Navy jets had come in. If there was, a, we surrounded an, on another uh, operation, we surrounded a pretty good sized base camp. They'd bring these Navy jets in, and they would just constantly go like this, one after another. And then we'd go in afterwards, and you'd just, there wouldn't be hardly anything left of individuals or the like. Uh, you know, if they, they got that's what we'd do was surround them and then uh, seal it off, and they'd bring in the jets and the like. Uh, and also, the, uh, uh, when you went up uh, uh, north, you'd run into the, B-52s up there, you'd still see where the huge craters are. And one of the things I asked Chen, I said, as a, as a Viet Cong, what are the things that you were most afraid of? And he said, B-50, B-52, he says, no, here, because you couldn't hear them. 
-hmm. and all of a sudden the ground starts shaking and it's going off. Uh, I remember one other operation we had, we went uh, around Long Bend. Our brigade main base was called Camp Frenzel Jones. It was named for the first two people from the 199th that were killed in Vietnam. And it sat right next to the world's largest ammo dump. Uh, but uh, uh, we had to go back. They figured that they got some ev evidence or intelligence was going to be a major offensive again against Long Bend and particularly that ammo, ammo dump. So they sent us out to this area. And all the trees have been defoliated with Agent Orange, and a lot of them have been knocked down by uh, uh, carpet, bombing. Yeah, carpet bombing and the like, and they were just desolate. So they sent us out, uh, our squad out on a patrol, and our sergeant at the time was a guy we called Chuckles. I don't know where he got his whiskey or his liquor, but he was a drunk. And he took us out, and we were supposed to go out on perimeter and set up there as a listening post. And uh, there's maybe nine or ten of us. Well, he leads us out, and it's kind of complicated, but we go to the left instead of the right. We were supposed to go to the right. And he gets us out there. And all of a sudden, you can hear the, the artillery in the distance. It goes boom, 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 boom. And then you can hear him whistle overhead. And then you know right then and there. It's, it was Arvin artillery, and we knew that right there. Okay. The second volley is going to fall a little short, and the next one's going to be right on us, because somebody's picked up that it's us out there, and we're somewhere we're not supposed to be. And sure enough, you can hear the thing. Well, Delvin Bentner, the other guy that I told you about, gets on the radio, chuckles, just can't handle it, and Delvin's with spec four. And you had to go back through our company command, battalion command, to the Arvins to get them to stop firing. Well. We hear the second one go off, and of course it comes up short, so now you're bracketed. Then the next one they fire for effect in the middle. And uh, he's trying to get him on the phone. Well, he does finally, but that third volley goes off. And fortunately, like most of the Arvins, they're horrible shots. That's Army Republic of Vietnam. They overshot us, but there was a short round they come in, and nothing scares you worse than artillery. You know, if you, you know, I could, I could imagine those guys in World War II, like in Hurricane Forest and all like how bad that was. But all of a sudden, you hear this one go, which means a short round, which means it can go off. And he hears it go plunk. And he got up in the morning, and it was literally 10 yards from where we were laying. And if it had gone off, it had gotten all of us. Chuckles lost his job. The only other thing I remember about that was that uh, I got bent by a centipede. I'm sleeping there at night. Centipedes are, you know, about that long and just vicious. And I hit it, my whole stomach swelled up like this. Uh, uh, but anyway, let me check my notes here. Uh. Yeah, one of the things about, you know, you get worn out physically. Because uh, you're up on guard duty every four hours. We never let just one person stay up on squad size. It always had to be two. Because you were just so, because uh, you can fall asleep. And it's so easy, it's so easy to do when you're sitting there. And uh, I know when I got to be sergeant, uh, I took an R&R &R to Bangkok and I bought this wonderful watch at a PX there at the, at the air base over there in uh, Seiko. And it lasted about, uh, Two days because the what they called the uh, your, we called bug juice the insect repellent we wore was so horrible it cracked the crystal on anything. So I had to have a watch with an incandescent thing because this is what you passed around. So I bought a cheap ten dollar Timex, and every time I'd go off and leave that somewhere, I'd be like, here's your cheap Timex wall, but you'd pass it around. I wish I still had that watch because it worked beautifully. <laughs> You know, the advertisement keeps on ticking, whatever. Yeah, but that was the other this thing. This is an important plaque. Can you yeah. explain that to us, please, in the inscription on it? Yeah. Uh, this was given to me uh, when I left uh, Vietnam. This, they, this was presented uh, by the company. It says to Sergeant Wall uh, for your service. And of course, it's got the uh, combat infantry badge. Volens et Potens is the 7th Infantry Division. That's a cotton bale there. And this is the 199th Light Infantry, the Red Catchers, uh, 
light, swift, and accurate was our, uh, was our motto, whatever. And that was given uh, as I left. And I think that it really, I think the armors who were making money hand over fist is why they gave it to us in the rear. Because we get these weapons caches, we bring them back, and they were right next to a long bin or, or a base there. And they, rather than, they would, I'm sure on their paper, so say that they were destroyed, then they would take these weapons, mount them on wood, take them over to Long Bend, and sell them to Air Force officers. <laughs> Souvenirs. <laughs> sort of all, <laughs> as a matter of fact, I called our company armor Milo Minder Binder from Catch-22. Remember the guy that made all the money until an Egyptian got him. <laughs> That's what I accused him of. But we would take these weapons, because I can, I can remember, because usually most of the time, we all, we all carried, that's one of the things I like to talk about, the things you carried. When you got up north to the other fire base, the things we carried would be, uh, uh, okay, uh, Claymore mine, two radio batteries, Pound a C4 explosive that we'd also use to cook with. Uh, two smoke grenades, four fragmentation grenades, 18 rounds, uh, and as much water as you could carry. When I was a sergeant, I'd get these new guys that come in and it all uh, get your C rations and I'd get these bean and weenies and I'd go through their packs and throw them out. And I'd quote the first line of Gunga Din, which was, You can drink your gin and beer when you're quartered safe out here. And you're sent to penny fights at altar, shot it. But when it comes to slaughter, you'll do your work on water, and you'll lick the blooming boots of him that's got it. Because the worst thing you could do is run out of water out there, and I make sure you get extra water. Here's a very, very important citation. Could you explain that to us, please, and the basis for this? Uh, yeah, this is the, yeah, this is the Army Commendation Medal. I got two of these while I was there for, for service with, uh, with the uh, 199th Light Infantry Alpha Company, 3rd Brigade. 7th Infantry. Uh, that's the Air Medal. This I don't. An I, extremely important medal. Yeah, you get an Air Medal if you ever saw the movie The Memphis Bell mm -hmm. for 25 missions. So yes. you got this when you did 25 uh, uh, assaults uh, by helicopter. You got an Air Medal, and I was working on my third one. And I did over, over 50, I don't know how many it was, 56, 57, something like that. Uh, the other ones are just a good conduct model. The other one there is the, is the most valued one by infantrymen is the combat infantry badge, a rifle. Uh, that means you've been, you've been actually in, in combat. What I call to it is the, well, I used to refer to it as the, as the thank God they're poor shooters medal. <laughs> uh, I don't have my bronze star with me because I actually got my, my last night in the field, the CO that I didn't get along with that walked us into the worst ambush ever. It's referred to in the book that I have there from the 7th Infantry Division where Phil Saloy uh, that ended up becoming the priest. And he walked us into a horrible ambush. He was a, cap, he was a captain wanting to be major. And the worst thing in the world you do if you, and we got ambushed and I was, my, my squad was walking point. Got a young man, hadn't been in country two weeks, get, get shot. We pulled back Destiny Moth. And he gets up the next morning, and he goes back in the same way. Now, we didn't have a, I don't think we had a, a, a second, and we only had two platoons. We only had 44 men out there. When they started drawing people out, they didn't start replacing peoples. 44 people is about the, about the strength of a, a platoon should be with heavy weapons. And we had uh, uh, 19 people killed or wounded that day. Walked us, walked them right back in the same way. Because I'd been on point the first day, I now moved to the rear. That's the way you worked it. And there was only two platoons. So now I'm at the very rear, because my squad had been up front. And I knew, and so did Johnny Green and Pat O'Donnell uh, and Dave McKee and the rest of us knew in my squad. We knew what was going to happen. We were going to be, they were going to ambush us in a U-shaped ambush and then try and outflank us. And that's pre precisely what they did. And the battle went on, I don't know, six, seven hours. We ran out of ammunition so bad. Uh, but we could see them, when they start to outflank us, we hit them as hard as we possibly could. And uh, I actually ran back to resupply calendar. And just, you just grab something, you don't think about it. And I came back with just 
grenades. I'm about to get ammunition for the machine gun <laughs> and grenades. And all I can remember, you, you, I guess your adrenaline gets going so much you don't remember exactly what you did or how you did it or whatever. But I just remember start throwing grenades just as fast as I could because we were, we were very close to being overrun. And it was just horrible. So that's one month. I was a short timer anyway. And I'd had a job signed up, set up in the rear. And he'd kept me from going to that. And the captain told me he was going to keep me out in the field. The top row called me an eight ball. And I said, OK. And then the last day, he comes up. Last, my last night in the field, I'm only two days away from I'm putting in 365 days out here. This is my 363rd day. He says, well, Wall, I'm going to put you in for the Bronze Star, you know, and of what you did there on, the, you know, on, the, on March 1st, which is great. And I said, you can keep that Bronze Star. I said, you just get me off this mountain tomorrow. And we were on a mountain. And he was kind of worried because we had to use just about every explosive we had to blow the thing to get one helicopter in at a time. And they landed. And I was on the last helicopter out, and I'm sitting on the outside on the edge of it. And I'll give you an example here, <laughs> like this. And you're hanging out, and somebody's doing it. This helicopter's up in the air. It's going like this. And this 19-year-old kid flying, or 20-year-old kid, goes down like this and turns to the left. And I actually come out of the thing. And two guys are holding me on. And he lands it. Now, that was my last helicopter flying out of the field. The next day, I go back to the base camp to come out. And I was supposed to take a convoy. We were up north of Saigon, past the old Michelin rubber plantation. And I take a helicopter instead to get back quicker. And that convoy gets ambushed. And the only general killed in ground combat and combat war was General Bond, another man I really respect. We all really respect him. He was what you call a Mustang and come up through the ranks. He lands and is killed, shot as soon as he gets off the helicopter. And they were waiting on him. And uh, so that's one that I missed, lucky. Another one, one, another one I missed is when I went to, got a second R&R &R because of uh, uh, Monkey, we called him Monkey, because he climbed a tree and saved us all one day. Got to, uh, there he is, Clyde Maynard from Louisville, Kentucky. Clyde got the tip of his thumb shot off, which is a million dollar wound. And so uh, he had an R&R &R to Japan. He got the tip of his stump? No, 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 he got the tip of his thumb shot off, thumb. Which is a million dollar? Because he got to go home. <laughs> <laughs> he was a short timer anyway, he only had a little time to go. So he had an R&R &R to go to Japan. Uh, here's where I took one, I'd already had an R&R &R to Bangkok. Well, the, our top kick, top sergeant, back at the fire base, top row. Uh, I had a buddy of mine, Tom Woods, in a letter there, he used to send me a fifth of Jack Daniels once a month. Well, I'd always share that with Top. So Top says, hey, Wall, you want to go to Japan? I said, Top, I've already been to Bangkok. He, don't get he said, no, by the time I get paperwork caught up, you'll be out here, Wall, don't worry about it. So I said, okay. So I ended up going to Japan, uh, and uh, you got a picture here of me at the state of the hotel. Didn't had, had to borrow money to get there from other soldiers. That's me in the middle of the Sukiyaki party, but anything to get out of combat. And uh, uh, when, I, when I, I came back, that's when I didn't do it. Somebody else had, in the rear gave orders for me to come back to uh, uh, have a job in the rear driving truck, and that was in February uh, when this happened. And, Unfortunately, while I was gone, we had about a half dozen guys killed mm. when I'm on that R&R. &R. Now, I was happy I missed it, but, you know, you almost feel sad because I wasn't there because a couple of them were guys that uh, I was with and you know, fought with and the like. Uh, but any opportunity you could get to, you know, so anyway, Jack Daniels paid off for me one way. Uh, uh, the, uh, let me refer to my notes here. Yeah, the, the Eagle flights uh, were uh, down in the Delta, and then we went up uh, probably the one that we went over to take over a fire base from 1st Air, First Air Cav, Cavalry Division, and uh, they had been almost overrun. They sent us in. Been, the company had been, the time had been beat up pretty bad. So they sent us into that fire base, basically to take it down, tear it apart. But they sent our company out on patrol around there. And uh, it was one of those things, again, where you walk through the, a walking point and then walking through a 
fence. There's a little sign that says men. And I went, oh my goodness, here it comes again. So we set up that night, but now, because our platoon was first, now we're second. And we run into another bunker, and guy steps on a Claymore mine. Oh, yeah, just awful. And uh, get three guys killed, he's, he's killed almost instantly. And what they'd done is they'd taken our Claymores, mm -hmm. our, one of our old batteries that had been discarded out of, out of use, some wire, and a uh, bottle for your bug juice. So when, you, when he stepped on it, it went like that and set it off like that. Well, this is awful. And he'd just gone up, he'd gone right, and I was just heading up the hill to the left to set up a blocking thing, because there was a, a uh, uh, bunker in there. So we pull back, and it's just awful. So we go on up and around it. You know, they mark it on a counter, which is why you want to destroy it. Uh, just, we got artillery, let's use it and do it. And they fly us across the river. Well, when you're coming across the river, when you looked at smoke, if it was red smoke, that means get ready for action. If it was white smoke, it was safe. If it was purple smoke, we're not quite sure. But if it was red smoke, when you're in those helicopters up there, and when you got in the helicopter, you'd take your uh, magazine, so you don't want anybody shot accidentally, and turn it upside down and put it back in your M16 so it's not loaded, right? Well, when you see that red smoke, you pull that magazine out, you put that thing in there, and you pull it back, you get ready to go because there's going to be action as soon as you hit the ground. And there was. They were waiting for us when we were in there, and they, they fired at us, and then they pulled back. You know, we just we, we made an assault on them on there. We didn't, you know, uh, I don't think we got anybody. I don't think we got anybody hit. But we set up that night on their, right on top of one of their bunkers hit where, well, I got the captain comes up to me the first thing the next morning. He says, well, I said, I'm going to put you back on point. Uh, okay, yeah. Because really, it should have been second squad's turn to go on point. He said, I'm going to put you back on point. I said, Captain Merson, that's fine. I'll do that. Well, Chin, Chin's walking behind me. I asked him to do that. So he walks behind me. And we're walking along the trail. And these guys would stop and take a crap right in the, right in the middle of the trail. <laughs> and I look over here, and here's an artillery round that's set up. It's waiting for you to go over there to pick it up. You understand what I'm saying? And I remember what Chin's saying. I'm walking along with that, with that rifle barrel right on the thing. I remember what Chin's saying. Stay, off, stay on the trails. Don't get off of it. And I go over there, and I got a, a light anti-tank weapon, what we call the law, which is sort of like a bazooka. I replaced the bazooka, light anti-tank weapon. And that's laying over there. And so we go out into this open area where there's tall elephant grass. And I send word back. I said, well, I'm, I'm staying on the trail. And I said, well, everybody stay on the trail. Well, guys don't listen behind me. The you know, second platoon behind us takes Croft across this elephant grass, and boom, there goes one. Then here comes, yells for a medic. The medic runs over, boom, he hits one. You know, they're laying there. Here comes another, boom, just like that. Four explosions went off in just that period of time. And we dust a guy off, dust these, get these guys, pull them out, and everybody just stares where they are. Now, I stay on the path, right? And then after they've dusted them off, there's another guy coming out, and he hits another one. They've got to dust him off. And the captain comes up to me, and he says, and he asks me, he says, well, I said, what do you think? And I says, they're sitting on that hill over there laughing at us right now. And I said, they're probably waiting for us to set up. They're going to hit us with more. So I said, we need to get out of here. And he said, which way would you go? And I said, I'd go down this way. And he says, okay, you're on point. Get us out of here. I said, all right. I said, everybody just stay back of me. And that's the time I almost shot Menendez because this Puerto Rican guy from uh, New York, uh, you know, I he couldn't help it. He just had to talk all the time. And I'm trying to listen to the radio behind me because I'm speaking. And he just wouldn't shut up. And I turned around and threatened to shoot him. And he threatened to shoot me, which is the last thing in the world. Which is, and all of a sudden it dawned on me, you know, this is not the time to lose your cool. A lesson that might be learned by a lot of people. Uh, but uh, anyway, that was, uh, that was uh, particularly uh, a bad experience as well. They pulled us out of there. You know, we had that many guys wounded, they, they, pull, you out of the, they pull you out of the field. Uh, which brings me up to the time we shot the mailman. Uh, 
or they gotten some intelligence information. They sent us out with some, and we were angry. We were coming out of the field. We'd been out for 10 days. Uh, that was the operation down in the Michelin rubber plantation. Michelin had a huge rubber plantation between Long Bend and Swan Lock. And Swan Lock, that's where the asphalt ended, and Highway 1 after that was just a dirt road. And uh, uh, we'd been in the Michelin rubber plantation, and it was just horrible. We ran out of water, right? And it's nothing worse, like I say, than running out of water. And uh, they tried to resupply us by dropping these canisters of uh, shell casings with plastic bags of them in the water, and they all broke when they had the ground. Hmm. And you're walking along and you're sweating, and all of a sudden, you're walking by these plants, your eyes start burning, and it's going crazy. You don't know what it is. You don't know what it is, and it's just you can't see. And all of a sudden, you realize there are these little peppers just hotter than all get out. So because you're sweating, you're getting on them. And then it starts raining, and you pull your hat out to catch the rain. But the first thing you do is you take the picture of your girlfriend out. You put it in your pocket, because everybody carried the picture of their wife or their girlfriend on the top of their helmet. So when you stop, you take your helmet off, and sit down and look at it, and put it back on. And we come off that operation. They bring us back for a mat. Now, oftentimes, we'd go back with to do the brigade main base up at Mace, right by Signal Mountain. They sent us out on what you call rat patrol. We'd go out on a jeep with an M60 machine gun on it, and we'd stop buses and you know get these people off, and they're all mad because you get them out and you're supposed to search things for VC if they're bringing anything in and the like. And uh, well, one time we got run off the road by an Arvin tank and flipped uh, actually flipped over. But uh, uh, anyway, they go back out. We're going back out on the field right away. They said this is good intelligence. We're going to put out these little listening devices that look like little helicopters with little triangles on They're motion devices you put yeah. along trails. Mm -hmm. And we were really mad because they were sending us out on armored personnel carriers, not helicopters and not trucks where we walk in. We are on this armored personnel carriers going down this damn logging road. And I'll tell you about shooting the elephant and the monkeys too in a minute, but anyway, uh, we're on this logging road. And so we're kind of, all of a sudden, we're, we take a lunch break, we're sitting there, the platoon is. We're, we're all pissed. We haven't even had a shower yet since we've been out in the field for 10 days. And a shower is nothing but a cattle tank, and you got five minutes of hot water, and everybody else got a cold shower, but it was still a shower. That's how they heated the water, was in these rubberized cattle tanks. But anyway, you hear these two guys whistling. Everybody's real quiet. Well, Johnny Green, the machine gunner, you know, gets ready, the machine gunner gets ready, and they kill these two guys. And it was a paymaster, so we give all the money to Chin, and he's tickled to death. And it's the, and he's carrying the mail between the NVA units that are up there. And uh, oh, remind me to tell you about getting dropped off the map too. But anyway, the uh, uh, we asked Chin to start reading the letters, and he opens it up, and it have these pictures in them, these beautiful young girls, and they're. You know, those beautiful dresses that the Vietnamese have, some of them in color. We certainly miss you. I can't wish you were home. Wish you were here. Love you dearly. You know, I'm planning the wedding whenever you can make it back. And the letter's going the other way. The bugs are horrible. Food is terrible. I miss you so much. Mm -hmm. And everybody got quiet because those are the same things we were writing. Mm -hmm. And our loved ones were writing to us. And all of a sudden, you just got the feeling that, God, those guys don't want to be here either. We would all be rather someplace else. And that moment always stuck with me as well. Now about the elephants and the monkeys. One thing about monkeys you want to run into up there, they'd come out of the trees and come down and beat the ground and scare you. But we were out in the woods and up, up, in the, up in War Zone D, as opposed to when we were down, I'll talk to you about going out on the boats in the south, is it was a logging thing. Well, they don't have caterpillar tractors, they got elephants. So you always find some monkeys and set up by them because if the NVA or somebody comes up, they're going to come out of the trees and go after them because they figure you're now their buddies, right? Mm -hmm. So we're sitting there and I've got to, we got the trip wire set up with the, uh, flares on them, so if, you know, if you trip them, you know, you know what's going off. We've got the claymore set up. 
So all of a sudden you hear this movement out there. Thing. Johnny Green wakes me up. Says, Sorry, it's gone. There's somebody out there. Well, get ready. It's good. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. And all of a sudden somebody pa panics and blows a claymore. Well, when that happens, everybody opens up with everything you got. And then finally, you know, somebody says, cease fire, cease fire. And you hear this, it was an elephant. <laughs> because they just let them loose out there and they come back during the day to use them. Well, this is awful. So who do you think gets the job to go out there and finish this elephant off? The four things dying. So I, take, oh. so I take Johnny Green out there with me, the machine gunner. And he must have put 65, 70 rounds in that elephant's head before it finally just stopped dying. And you feel so horrible, because they're beautiful animals. I actually saw a tiger over there, got run over by a deer one time too, as opposed to, and I'll talk about the, the fire answer, what was horrible. So anyway, so we have to now stay there again while a guy, while they, while they come out in a helicopter, we find a place for them to land, secure it, and the guy's there, they gotta pay off the guy for us killing the elephant. And that's, that's only reasonable, I would think. The amount of money wasted on the war, but I've just, you know, just one of those, sure. you know, the monkeys and the elephants. Uh, but the, I mentioned the fire ants. One of the worst things you could have, other than the leeches, when you're particularly down the Delta, you'd cross a stream, and first thing you do when you get on the other side is pull the leeches off you. Is the fire ants? When you'd be walking along, they'd be hanging like on the back of a nipple on leaf. They they hit you and come down your back. And the only thing you could do is stop, because they stung so bad. As you'd stop take your clothes off and everybody come up and beat them off of you. That's what you had to do. And uh, uh, the food I carry is, after a while you learn that you're not gonna carry beans and weenies out there because most, most of the equipment you carry and everything else is already weighing 80 pounds. Uh, generally, we'd assign so many light anti-tank weapons and I mentioned the, uh, you know, you gotta carry your water, you gotta carry your radio batteries, you carry your poncho, uh, you carry those things, you carry 18 rounds of ammunition, and by the way, even though, even though it was a 20-round magazine, you only put in 18 because had, the M16 had a tendency to jam if you had 20 in them. So that first round, it'd, it'd catch. And so if you put 18 in them, it just didn't seem to catch or whatever. And when you came back, you always t took apart every magazine you had, everything you had, and, you, and put it back together again. Uh, but uh, anyway, well, let me tell you about the young, the, about, you know, talking about the... Uh, getting blown up with your own claim, with your own equipment to claim more mines. Because one of the things we did at Firebase Mesa is we had to guard the, uh, the, the uh, dark garbage dump. So there's always kids around. So you got this one, one, one kid, you know, about nine or 10 years old, he's carrying his brother on his back. His brother's got no hands, no feet. Mm. So we say, you know, we ask him, what happened? What happened? He goes, brown hair, brown hair. So what happened? Brown hair, brown hair, VC. His brother had brown hair, and then a soldier had fathered him, so the VC cut off his hands and his feet. Mm. Yeah. Like they say, war is terrible not just for the killing because you have no good choices. You do something cruel and ugly or something crueler, you have an uglier still. And, uh, that's that's a dehumanization of it, and you know, kids, you know, uh, just you know, we saw the horrible things ourselves, but to see something like that was vicious, uh, which is uh, we uh, let me check my notes here very quickly. You know. Yeah, in the bean field. One operation, we're close to my end, they were in a bean field or whatever, and uh, we were out, and we, we were destroying what we thought was a rice cache for the VC. We blow it up. And uh, then that night we're there, and we hear this, you know, and I'm asleep under the thing, and all of a sudden I feel this arm on me, and Johnny Green, the machine gunner, opens up right over the, I'm laying there asleep right over the top of me, and I roll over, and, I was willing enough to start firing out there. And uh, we'd killed four VC just, just a few feet away. And uh, one of them was a woman, and she was carrying things to teach kids about the VC. 
mm. and about how bad Americans were or whatever. Mm. And we gave, we gave that to them. Uh, but it turns out we'd blown up the mayor's uh, rice thing, so there comes the helicopter again to pay the people off for us doing the destruction that we did. Uh, yeah. And Christmas, I remember that day. We marched uh, five clicks to a dirt road to get some mashed potatoes and turkey and everything mixed together and then march five clicks back into the jungle again because the general could tell everybody that all his troops got a hot meal on Christmas Day. <laughs> One of the things about the Delta too, it was a free fire zone after nine o'clock at night. And uh, three or four times we'd go out on these, uh, like old World War II landing craft, uh, part of the Riverine group. And which was, one nice thing about it was after the night we come back, you're always muddy, and we'd come back to a Navy ship, they'd hose you off. Really, the mud was just that stinking bad. Wow. And uh, then you'd have the best chow in the world with the Navy, because Army chow was horrible. <laughs> And the Navy had the best challenge. That was the only nice thing we liked about it. But you'd go out in this, they'd drop you off. And a, like a platoon or a squad at a time, you'd get off and you'd set up an ambush along one of these canals. And every night, somebody about nine o'clock, they'd be coming down there in sand pans. You'd open up on them and you'd lay there in the, in the night. And uh, just that stinking gray mud. And you couldn't, you'd, you'd take your regular poncho, not your poncho liner, but regular poncho and lay it down so you, at least you're not Laying directly in the mud, yeah. The sand pans were not given any warning before you opened up. No, it's free fire zone. After 9 o'clock at night, if they're down there, they're up to no good. There is one guy we let go because he was sounding like he was drunk and he was singing. So it didn't sound like he was by himself. And we had these, uh, and you can see pretty, down in the Delta, the Starlight. Did you have some fire back indicating they were true VC? Uh, no, we, we'd get the boats and you'd find the weapons on them on them. You know, they'd pull the little sand pan, we'd pull in after the thing. We'd, you'd have to go down into the mud and get it. So you knew that they were, that's who it was. But you know, you got a guy coming along singing at the top of his lung with a light in front of the boat. He's not a VC. So we let that guy, we let that guy go that time. Uh, but uh, uh, any, you know, the, uh, let me see. Free fire zone, yeah. You mentioned the phrase, Mark, of being dropped off the map. Oh, yeah, that, yeah, there you go. This is a good one. You like this. You know, you, you have these maps. When I carried, I carried the radio over there for a while, too, and you had the, you know, you were very important. So you'd carry the codes and a plastic thing around your neck, mm -hmm. and you just couldn't because you were the communications that got you out. Well, that's good as long as you have somebody you can talk to. So we're out on an operation. We've now lost our uh, third, second lieutenant, very nice, good, good lieutenant, uh, West Point fellow. Accidentally got shot in the ass. I think one of our guys accidentally shot him because when you go down and around like this, somebody starts shooting up front, you get these guys. I mean, you know, I was old school, top of my father, you don't shoot at anything unless you know what you're, what you're shooting at. But some of these kids, you know, from, they just start firing. I think they accidentally shot him. Uh, uh, but, uh, Wounded, but not. Yeah, yeah. wounded. Uh, but anyway, so I'm only a spec four, but I'm second in command. We're being led by a 19-year-old dairy farmer from uh, Wisconsin, Delvin Bentner. And they were given this plastic map. And they drop us in this area. Well, first thing we're trying to do is make radio contact because we're, we're sort of got our company spread out in your thing and we're looking for cachet and the like. Well, all of a sudden we see this trail and you could tell because of the almost tennis shoes like the NVA war, NVA war and they were pretty fresh. So we can barely make contact. So we take the, you had, the ra you had two antennas for your radio. One was real tall, one was real short. So Monkey, because he could climb, we sent him up in this tree. 
a monkey's up there with a radio, and we're looking for, they'd fire an artillery shot, where we know that sound travels at, what is it, 800 feet a second, or 600 feet a second, I forget which. But anyway, they'd shoot a round up there, and it'd go off, and you'd get the direction with the compass, and you'd count the seconds until the, the sound came. Well, we're all looking over here, and the thing goes, Poof, over here. Oh my goodness, where are we at? We're nowhere near where we're supposed to be. So, you know, you turn around, he's waiting for another round, and I'm down below and I look down there, and here comes uh, six or seven NVA, all fully loaded down with packs. And they don't see us because they're all bent over because they're carrying stuff, they're all bent over like this. So all of a sudden, now we're in a firefight. There's monkey up in the tree. We're scrambling to get out of there. And there's only 14 of us. We did have Chin with us. So we go back and set up. We still have no contact by radio with anybody. If we get in trouble, we can't call artillery, can't call in the Air Force, can't call in hel helicopters or anything else. We're pretty much it. So anyway, I go back make a little bit of contact. Delvin sends me out to ambush the next day. So I go out there with about six guys, seven guys. Back on the trail, he tells me to go back out there and I set up an L-shaped ambush. And, you know, put the uh, uh, Claymore mine, got two Claymore mines so they blow this way. Uh, have two machine guns so they're cross-firing us too. And sure enough, here comes six guys walking down the thing. We hadn't been there for 15 minutes and we blow the ambush. And, uh, you know, I go out there to check them out. And it's amazing what, what, what the human will do. And they had actually crawled a good distance. You know, after they'd been, they, were, they weren't going to make it. You know, they were, you know, four of them, we had four of them. Two of them, I think, I, I think we wounded them pretty seriously. Two of them we wounded. And they don't, you know, they're not going to make it. And, uh, uh, you know, get to, you know, get to what information you can off of them and head back. So we're still not there. So, okay, now what are we going to do? Well, look, we don't want to go back that way. Stay off that trail. That's bad luck. We've been in two firefights here, and we've been lucky so far. So we head off in this direction, run up again, and all of a sudden, Chin's walking up front with, a, with another fellow, and you hear somebody yelling Vietnamese. Don't, 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 don't. Well, when we hear that, everybody gets down. There's a ravine right next to us, so we get down in the ravine. And Chen answers, and he gave the wrong word. And all of a sudden, you can hear the rocket propelled grenades start coming through, breaking things. And we just seen, I tell people this, and they look at me like I'm nuts. I said, I'd seen a mock up of a tank made out of sticks. A mock up of a tank made out of sticks. And so, they, you know, they just open up, and you can, we're laying there, and I'm just watching the trees being chopped down by machine gun fire. Mm. So we fire a volley back, which gets their head down, and they were just popping out of holes. You could see their heads popping out mm -hmm. of holes. So we fire back the best we can and take off. We get down in an open space in front of us here, lay down on the ground. We have no radio contact, no help. And, uh, you know, we, I just, I figured, I said an act of contrition. I really thought, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna see noon today. That's it. And Jerry McGee's with us, is always funny, he says something funny, and I start to laugh a little bit. So, you know, we relax a little bit. And we laid there and laid there and laid there. We expected that, well, okay, we'll see what, you know, when, if they're gonna come here, we're gonna come there, because we can't, we, we wanna be as quiet as you possibly can be. And uh, they didn't come, and we snuck on out. Finally, we went in the right direction, hooked up with the rest of the company, found a huge cache, cache of arms. They targeted that place, and they then bombed it with artillery, and with, which, is the way to, which is the way to do it. Uh, but that's when they dropped us off the map. Then the other one was the guy, uh, when I'm eating the beans and weenies, and we've been out on another, op, went back into that same area about a week later. So we knew we were going to go back in there. This time they sent Lieutenant Watson with us, who had been an executive officer. And, uh, you know, so I, I, you know, I finally made sorry, I, they got me my sergeant stripes while I was there. Because I'd been up, I just hadn't got them yet. So anyway, put two young guys on a listening post. And I'm sitting there cross-legged eating what is a huge big tree. And I'm sitting there. A guy rocks around the corner like this. Stands me, stands me from me to you like this. Just looks at me. He's got a big pack on his back. The guy's in the listening post. Young guys had frozen. And let six VC walk around. They must have been packed, traveling groups of six. 
So anyway, I opened up. I you know, was just sort of like, who's going to shoot first? Like Matt Dillon, I shoot first, hit him, kill him. We open up, wound another one. So we got one wounded guy. It's just about dark. And we're starting to pull back, and I'm squatted down. And I watch those green tracers go over my head again. Mm. And you know, when it, you know when the guy's aiming at you when, you, when you hear the sound after it passes your head. <laughs> so anyway, Watson is going to save this guy that's wounded, the Viet Cong, was, or NVA frozen, is wanting to send him back because that's, it, because that's the way Al Watson was this U.S. Army all his whole life, retired, you know, we have a prisoner here with valuable information. So we're in a, you know, tri we're in the jungle, and we call the helicopter out, and it comes out and lowers down the thing. And I help load the guy on, you know, and he's moaning and groaning. The medic has treated him a little bit, and it goes up to the helicopter. All of a sudden, you hear this. You know, and the radio is We're all scared to death that we're going to get, you know, they're going to come back and whatever it is, they're going to come back and force against us. All of a sudden, that guy just comes out and bounces on the ground three or four times. The guy comes on the radio and says, don't you ever send us out here to pick up another gook again. You know. And I go, well, okay. You know, that's the way you want, that's the way you want, that's the way, that's the way you want to do it. Uh, but, uh, you know, that was the, you know, inhumanity of it. Uh, you know, what, you know. But I could understand because they, you know, the, these fellows that fly out there and fly those helicopters are out there to, they figure to save American lives and you guys are out there to kill these guys and don't jeopardize our lives by coming out for a guy like this because they're vulnerable out there in those helicopters as well. So they understand how they, they understand how they felt. But uh, uh, anyway, that was, uh, that was, uh, that was uh, rather interesting. Uh, yeah, the, 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 the physical wearing down of you. When I would, when I would eat, I'd just, I'd go through the sea rations and pick out the tins of, small tins of beef and peanut butter and crackers. Uh, you'd have coffee. Uh, first couple days, you know, down in the Delta, you were only out for two or three days at a time. And like I said, you'd always come across the uh, a little village down there where you'd get some tea Oh, I also, I'll tell you about the time I ate the sandwich. And because they, they made wonderful French bread. And I'm sitting there eating, very sweet, and I'm eating the sandwich. And, uh, you know, I said, you know, just dried meat on it. And I asked Chin, I said, what is this, Chin? He goes, I said, rabbit? No, 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 no. I said, rat? He goes, yeah. <laughs> so I'm eating, I'm eating dried, I'm eating dried rat, but it tasted good, let me tell you that. I finished it. <laughs> I figured if natives eat it, I'll eat it too. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Chin? Oh. These are absolutely fascinating yeah. exploits as a specialist for. Yeah. And you were there for 13 months? Yeah. Well, I ended up coming back a sergeant. I actually went up the board for a staff sergeant, and then I, when I got back to uh, Fort Riley, they, they took the stripe away from me because I went to the swimming pool instead of the motor pool. <laughs> <laughs> But I ended up carrying the colors for the 1st Infantry Division, the big red one, on a parade field up there at the, at the thing. Because Fort got, Riley. Yeah, at Fort Riley, because uh, I had a first cousin who was a sergeant major. You know how sergeant majors all know each other. And he found out that was, and I found out I had a little Volkswagen. I got the picture, picture of the car, me in a uniform standing next to it. So I got, uh, I got that. Uh, you know, let, let me wrap this up by, by when saying. When you were coming home, yeah. there was an incident on your travel from Vietnam back to Middletown in San Francisco. Yeah, well, you come back to San Francisco, and of course, you know, you're coming out of the field, Jim, and all the time you're over there, you know, you talk like this at night, because you know what, because your voice carries, and the Delta really over water. You know, like the night of, they marched us out there, even in the rain, you just, I will never forget, if you ever marched with a pebble in your, I'm, we did a forced march on about two and a half miles on a, or three or four clicks, as they say, with a pebble in your boot, and you had to lay in that water all night like that. Just don't talk like this. You don't have to do it. But anyway, when it, when it landed in, in Oakland, it put you in a brand new uniform to go home. It was like three o'clock in the morning. When a plane lifted off in Vietnam, everybody just goes nuts. You know, just cheers. Sure. We're all coming. Every, every, every soldier had the same experience. And they warned you there, and they said, look, 
when you go to the San Francisco airport over here, there are protesters here and they're organized. And what it's going to be, it's going to be a couple girls and a man. Mm -hmm. And the man's going to come up and spit at you. And then mm -hmm. you're going to stand up in uniform and go over to punch the guy, and the two girls are going to step forward and scream. Don't get up. And then they're going to arrest you, and you're going to go to jail in San Francisco. Don't get up. So you're sitting there. Now, I'm trying to fly into Cincinnati, but the air traffic controllers in Cincinnati are on strike. This is the airport in Oakland, California. Yeah, this is the airport in San Francisco. Because you land in Oakland, but they take you to, take you to San Francisco, fly out of San Francisco airport. Ground transport from Oakland to San Francisco airport. Yeah, yeah. I think it was a cab I took. Sure. Uh, but anyway, uh, flying standby. Uh, so you have to wait there until the plane comes up. Well, the air traffic controllers in Cincinnati are on strike, and I'm trying to get a flight. So I sat there almost a day, and they came around, I know at least three times, maybe four, and did that, tried to pull that same back. Finally, the guy saw it was me again, and he just goes like this, doesn't do anything. And uh, the, uh, uh, I'm reading a newspaper on the front page of San Francisco Chronicle about General Bond being killed mm -hmm. on that last day when I was out there. And it just, you know, it just, just the, you know, all I want to do is go home. Mm -hmm. uh, the lights was overwhelming. I weighed, you know, I'd lost, you know, almost 45 pounds, 25 open sores in my body. My wisdom teeth had come in and rotted out. Uh, you, you almost got to, from being around that dust, you almost get a red color to your skin. And I just wanted to go home. Have a big boy French fries vanilla Coke. That's what I wanted. <laughs> Fresh is big boy vanilla Coke. And finally, I got a flight out of there, got home. I had to fly to Omaha, to Chicago, and actually flew into Dayton. And Mom and Dad uh, came up and picked me up and had a nice, wonderful homecoming. And uh, Linda was there, my, my, now my wife, uh, who I uh, dated uh, while I was there. And uh, I still had time to go. I went out to Fort Riley, Kansas. And looking back, when I was upset at the time, saying, look, you had me. You know, what, 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 what more do you need me for? And they sent me out to Fort Riley because you still had the Big Red One had come out of Vietnam. Got to find a Charlie Company, second of the 16th, uh, Rock of Chickamauga was their uh, phrase. And uh, got in charge of the pers Armored Personnel Carrier, and we go out in the field and play games with the uh, 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 National Guard or games, put on a fire demonstration for West German generals. And uh, that's when I got in trouble. We had an IG inspection coming up because Big Red One goes on Reforger every year to flies to Germany where they uh, participate in war games. They did at that time uh, with uh, you know in West Germany. Uh, so anyway, I'm supposed to go down to the uh, motor pool and I put my swim trunks when I fall out in the morning after PT. And Sandy and I go over to the officer swimming pool where we bribe the guy to get in. Where we're in there with all the officers. Uh, daughters and things were swimming in a swim pool, and I look up. Uh, I'm floating there on a float. And I look up, and there's my company commander escorting two German generals. <laughs> so he calls me and Sandy in and says, "Look, I just can't let you go. Wall, you're going to lose that stripe. You're going to have to do. You're going to have to do. Uh, going to have to stay. You know, you're confined to the the, to the post this weekend, and you got to go over here and do work over at the brigade, over at the division headquarters." So I go over there, and that's where we end up. Sandy and I, we're about the same height, about 6'2", six 6'3". Six we end up carrying the colors for the 1st uh, Infantry Division. And with all the battle streamers that they had, where anybody retired, they had over at the old parade grounds and, and the like. But one of the other things, you know, you mentioned, Jim, about uh, the attitude of the people at the time. Yes. We spent three weeks on riot control training. Now, this is the United States Army's most decorated division the big red one, right. and they were training us. And that weekend of the March on Washington in 1970, we were on stand down. The 1st Infantry Division, we were confined. They had the planes on the ready at the airport there. Whether it was St. Louis or Chicago or Washington, D.C., they were going to fly us there. And they told us tactics where you form a diamond if you have an agitator and you go in and you pull them out and the like. And we'd sit around. These are kids our own age. Oh, we're not going to do this. We're not going to do this or whatever. Oh, my goodness, we can't do this. So you're, but, 
active duty career ends and 45, 50 years later, you're still providing service to your country through the court system. Tell us about that. Well, uh, Jim, one of the things I did, it's been, well, it was 2011. I started to see these young people. Now, one of the, th one of the other things I do is I do marriages. And uh, we're, we had $40 court costs, but I waived it for people that were in the military. So all these young, uh, young men uh, in their dress blues in the Marine Corps, their uh, Army, Army green, uh, their, Navy, their Navy, uh, Navy uniforms. They were, I was marrying these young couples. They were getting married as they were going off. Uh, my secretary had a son that did two tours in uh, Army Reserve out of uh, Fort Mitchell, Kentucky in the uh, engineers. Uh, she had a daughter that did two tours on the uh, USS Enterprise on the Admiral staff. And so I just have this. Uh, I saw these young men coming back. They had this look in their eye. They were getting into trouble, whether it was domestic violence. Uh, they were having a hard time readjusting, which is what I was pointing out about uh, Fort Riley. Now, I went out there with, with a bunch of people about your, you know, everybody had to, almost the same experience. And you had a time to decompress before you came back to civilian life. And these guys are coming off the plane. They're coming home to family responsibilities. They're coming home to debt that they can't pay. They're coming home to these things. The pressure is on them. They're suffering from post-traumatic stress syndrome. They don't know what to do. They're getting themselves in trouble. People, they feel that uh, they don't understand what they've been through. They find it difficult to communicate with people. And they were starting to come through my court. So there was a judge up in Mansfield that started this. So I thought, well, I don't want to sit here and not do anything about this. Let's do something. So I started what I call a veterans court, contacted the Veterans Administration in Dayton. They were wonderful. Uh, we coordinated this, talked talk, talk to the police department, because one of the things you got to in, interview about it, Jim, was veterans sometimes don't want to admit they've been in the service. They're embarrassed. And so we said, police, we need you, when you're processing these people, to let us know when it, before the first appearance whether they're veterans or not. So we now have a veterans court where either prior to your conviction or afterwards, I put you in veterans court. Uh, we hold it uh, uh, three times uh, a month. Uh, you meet with our probation department. Uh, they do an assessment about what you need. We contact the VA. Uh, we've had veterans uh, now of almost 160 all the way from World War II to today of various ages, sizes, and problems. Uh, we help them address the problems. Many of them have alcohol. Some had drug addiction problems. Mm -hmm. And uh, the VA has a 30-day in-house in program in a hospital up there. A lot of them, they just needed medical. Mm -hmm. Others, uh, they just needed to, to find a job. They had trouble doing it. They hook up with the VA. Sure. Some of them are homeless, and we, help them, and we help them do that as well. And one of the things about it is we have almost twice the success rate with people on probation in our veterans court than we do in our regular. And I think a lot of it has to do with their military background and their bearing, plus the VA, who gets a knock, uh, frankly, but they do just do a wonderful job, I think. So that's how I've tried to give back to, to the veterans there. Uh, I also uh, am active now. One of the things about, you know, when, when you came back from the war, per, first of all, to begin with, uh, I went back to law school. And before I'd gone, I'd gone down and talked to Dean, Dean Wilson at UC Law School here. He just died this past year with a wonderful man. He joked and said, Mark, we'll have a place for you as long as you make it back. And I said, thanks, thanks, Dean. <laughs> you feel that way. Uh, but there was, a, there was a few of us of that, of that ilk. But nobody wanted to talk about the war. Nobody wanted to hear about it. We all let our hair grow long. And, got on with our lives, got married, had kids, got a mortgage, did those things that you, uh, that you do when you, when you come back to civilian life. And one of the things in the summertime, I turned down a clerk's job in Cincinnati with, a, with an attorney that I'd uh, done some work with. He wanted, wanted to hire me, but he could only pay me $75 an hour. You know, and I could make $300 at the a week, week at the mill. I can't remember his name. I think it was, I think it was McCluskey was his name. Okay. But I had, uh, through my intern program there, I'd done, gone down and worked with him. Uh, but anyway, the, uh, 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 nobody wanted, wanted to hear about it. And I had actually gone up to join the American Legion. Somebody said, well, Mark, can they get a scholarship program up there? So I went up there and I filled out the form with my DD-214. And a guy comes out of the canteen. He looks down the hallway and he says, hey, Joyce, what do we got here? Another one of the Vietnam losers? Oh. Yeah. 
you know, I belong to American Legion now, but I just enjoy, oh, she was so nice, and I said, Joyce, no, thank you. You know, it was, I think, 250, I was eligible for a $250 scholarship. I said, no, thank you, that's fine. And there was that, really, the World War II guys, you guys are losers, we're not, you know. Sounds like Donald Trump, you know, you guys are losers, you know, we're winners or whatever. But anyway, the, uh, uh, you know, you just had that feeling. And the first, first instance I had was, uh, school teacher whose husband had been getting a veteran on uh, Veterans Day. So I think seventh grader around to interview me. Said, well, Mark, would you, would you, and she had been friends with my sister. I said, sure, I'll, do, I'll talk to her and come on in. And of course, they ask you the best questions. What was the food like? What were the bugs like? How bad did it rain? You know? And I just got you talking about it. And you didn't talk about some of the things we talked about, the horrible aspects of work, but all those great things. Did you miss your family? Would you, did they have anything for you when you come home? And you I talked about the care packages that we all got from our, from our parents. And Jack, you know, and my buddy Tom sent me a fifth, fifth of Jack Daniels every uh, uh, once a month. And uh, the letters I got from my wife that I just, uh, I mean, my girlfriend and my wife and how I carried her picture in my helmet. and. Uh, to this day, every time I stopped, I'd pull that off and take a look at it, and you dream, you know. Sort of, sort of kept you with with reality during one during the bad thing you're doing. And uh, you know, you don't tell her like you know, like I told you, the first patrol I went on, the LBJ sucks, and the last patrol I went on, the guy I had in the back of his helmet, fuck Nixon. So <laughs> it just, you know, that's just the way it was. I, you, you notice today, those guys don't write anything on their helmet back there, and everybody had the peace symbol or something else on it. And I think that and think that's because it was the last true what I call civilian. In other words, everybody you know everybody was eligible for the draft. And I got drafted before they had the lottery, uh, but you know, and the protests stopped when they did away with the with the, with the drafting. It's that simple. It was more of a I think anti-draft than it was an anti-war. Uh, but uh, anyway, you now have a professional army, and that's that's a lot different. Uh, but anyway, then, then you started to see it. And I think when the, when the first uh, uh, Iraq war happened, I think people uh, saw the military, how much it mm -hmm. really, how great these kids were and how they are, how they are today. But uh, anyway, uh, show you a few photographs there. That's a one of monkey. And you can see on what he's carrying there, you can see that's how the... Uh, I'm carrying my uh, magazines and bandoliers. He's carrying one of those shirts that we'd have the Mamasans make up. Uh, that's me outside the company headquarters at Brigade Main uh, Base. Uh, when I came off that second R&R &R to Japan, it was unauthorized. I'm standing up there. Like I said, there's the world's largest ammo damp, dump over here. That location again, please. Uh, that's, in, that's in Long Bend. Uh, fire, this is uh, Brigade Main Base Camp. Frenzel Jones, and uh, so they'd fire rockets, they'd set rockets to go off, and they'd go off at night, and then they would, I'm standing up here, at, well they had barracks actually up here, they had sandbags around it, getting ready to go down to the latrine, and a rocket comes in and just blows it apart. Mm. <laughs> but you had uh, enlisted men's club, there was uh, there were some drugs when you saw back in the rear, I saw a guy shoot up heroin in, in a Ford, came home, uh, but uh, I don't know, you know, we're, t we're addressing the, the heroin problem now, and I told people now, I said, you know, what do we do to handle that? Because a lot of those guys come back hooked to drugs, they got over it. And that's one of the other problems I'm wearing now. I'm on a yes. program for the uh, heroin addiction. We're just, it's just racking us now, including some of the veterans that come back. Uh, that's Chin. I, I, I used to say a prayer for him. I'm sure that he did, because he came over to our side, that the communists just did him in. It had to be. It was just so awful what we left. Uh, and the Vietnamese people were very nice people for the most part. They were, uh, when I built the house that I live in now, two doors down, it was a Vietnamese uh, family mm. that uh, ran the local Chinese restaurant. And I got a deck out back and I looked down, and you know how they are, you know, three generations of family living there, including Grandpa. And I see this guy in his black pajamas out there on that horrible clay ground, trying to hoe it up to plant a garden. I go back inside, tell Linda, I says, I'm having a flashback, Linda. Come out here, tell me I'm not. Because <laughs> it was, uh, you know, and that's all of a sudden our neighbors down the street. 
and uh, you know, just wonderful family. Uh, the Cambodian says, well, uh, and uh, on the trip to Bangkok, I had a wonderful cab driver. And the, the nice thing about the, about the one to Bangkok as opposed to Japan was it was almost like, uh, you know, you could go to the movie. And uh, Bangkok was a wonderful city and uh, uh, just wonderful sights to see. And you got the real flavor of the, of the Oriental culture that isn't at war or isn't trying to do things. I just, I just, uh, I, uh, the cab driver took us to his house for dinner on a canal, you know, Bangkok's to Venice. Would the Army give you free transportation to and from these R&R &R spots? Yeah, yeah, they would, uh, yeah. C-47 uh, or C-130? No, they'd be, they'd be regular airliners, jets. Uh, but it was no cost. Yeah, no, no cost, but you had to pay for the... Tigers usually had the contract. Yeah, right. Uh, but uh, the pecking order for R&Rs is this. Uh, if you're married, you want to meet your wife in uh, Hawaii. Hawaii. But you had to be in country almost 11 months to get that. Mm -hmm. The next uh, favorite place was Australia. Oh, by the way, we ran into some Australian troops out in the field. Ran into these guys and are wearing wool long sleeve uniforms. We couldn't believe it. You talk about tough. And the other tough, or the, uh, the rock soldiers, the Republic of Korea soldiers we were with, they were tough. Uh, but anyway, the next best place was Australia. Uh, then uh, the uh, next best place was Japan. That's like the R&R &R I got was in, you know, Monkey was in his like 10th month to get there. Then the next best desirable place to Where go. Where in Japan did you go? Uh, I went to the only place I could afford was a little resort town called Atami where they gave you a package deal for $180. And I found a little, uh, uh, I went to that Tsukiyaki party, found a little bar there. It was almost like a carnival town. And I uh, found a little bar there called the Golf Bar. And uh, they didn't have a jukebox, but they had a uh, record player. And so I'm in there. They also had Jack Daniels. So anyway, I'm in there. And as a gag, I used to, you know, pick up, I'd say, well, let me read your palms. I'd make something up. You know, I'd guess about it. You can always guess at it. So anyway, this girl's behind there, and she, I was telling her, she spoke a little bit of English. And, uh, you know, the town's full of cab drivers. I said, you used to be married to a cab driver. You know, I think, oh, yeah, she got all excited. So then she brings this lady back, that, you know, thing, and says, well, no, you do her, you do her. So I'm doing her this. And they're just laughing and having a good time. I found out that's what she does for a living is read tea leaves and that stuff. So they invited me out to dinner that night. They take me to this restaurant, and they said, no, 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 so no, no, no. They're very serious. They said, no, no, you tell them. I wasn't in uniform, so he says, no, you tell them you're French. You tell them you're French. So why is that? says, lady runs a restaurant. Her husband killed by Americans. She don't like Americans. And, of course, you go in, you sit down, cross-legged, small tables or whatever. And, you know, I, it was nice to get away, but uh, Bangkok was just, you know, you saw more. I saw uh, James Garner in Marlowe was the movie in a theater where uh, the voices were in Thai and the subtitles were in English. So I'm laughing at the inappropriate times. And I always remember that movie because Bruce Lee was in it as well. Uh, but, uh, but Bangkok was the earliest one you could get. You could get that in three months because it was so close and nobody wanted to go there. Everybody wanted to go to Hong uh, The next best one was Hong Kong. Then you had Taipei, which were Chinese than the earliest ones. So I figured that after three months there, I don't think I'm gonna get out of this place alive. That's, what you, that's the way you think. The first, first couple of months, you're, 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 you're so scared, you don't know what you're gonna do. So that's when I signed up for it. Because I figured I wasn't gonna make it out alive. I just looking at what's going around for you. Uh, then after about two or three months, you know, you say, what the hell? And you really become a good soldier. Then you get down your last couple of months and you go, oh wow, I'm gonna make it out of this unless I do something stupid or somebody makes me do something stupid. And that's the way that you, that's the way that you think. So I figured I took, I'm going to take Bangkok because I may not get a chance. <laughs> I'm at least going to have five days of, five days of good time. Uh, but it was an experience that I wouldn't wish on my worst enemy. But one thing about it though, and this, this is the thing you talk to soldiers and you see, boy, why would anybody go back? Why would anybody go back? Well, I don't, it's an, it's an adrenaline rush. Like you never had. It's not like being on a drug. I was never more alive in my life than I was there. I could tell you within five minutes what time of day it was. Sure. And you're one with nature, and you're outside, you're sleeping on the ground, you're doing these, you're doing these things. 
and you're with, a, you're with a small group of people that you really end up caring about a whole bunch. And uh, you're all looking out for each other. And that's what combat's about. You're looking to file for the guy to the right and the left of you in the line. And it's just like I talked about Monty Brandt coming up to that. I froze. This is my good friend, Pat. And I, I, my brain couldn't process it. And that's the difference between the guys who are really, really good and guys like me who are just average. Monty Brandt did that like that to save Pat's, to save Pat's life and my, maybe mine too. Uh, I think about the times that, you know, I shouldn't have made it out of there. And a lot of it is just pure luck. It's like, well, I walked point this day. If I hadn't walked point, maybe I'd have been that guy that stepped on that booby trap or I'd have been the guy that got shot up front. And those things stay with you. And I, one of the things that I've tried to do uh, is get up each morning and, and try and find something to those, to those uh, soldiers that didn't make it back. Uh, those of us who did owe it to them uh, to teach the others and to find some goodness and meaning to our own lives. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think and people ask me, well, why don't you have PTSD? I said, well, we all have PTSD. Mm -hmm. uh, some are worse than others. I said, but I think the time I spent out at Fort Riley talking to other soldiers and playing cards and doing that stuff allowed you to decompress. So when I came back here, it was that transition, because when you come back to the stateside army, it was much different than wartime. They left you alone over there. Nobody messed with you, because you, you know, you're liable to, you know, you're liable to do something, mm -hmm. and you know, nobody, you know, because you're, you know, you're, you know, 18, 19, 22 year old kids walking around with loaded weapons, <laughs> true assault rifles. <laughs> that everybody worries about today. So they, they, you know, as long as you did your job, people left you alone, and you knew you had to do it. And people talked about drugs, and I said, well, you come back to the to the fire base, guys just smoke marijuana. I said, but you couldn't function out in the field. You couldn't take the heat and the thing, nor would you put yourself or somebody else's life in danger by going out in the jungle or down in, uh, on an operation, laying for ambush, and, and, and you know, high on, high on narcotics of any kind whatsoever. Uh, you, just, you just couldn't do it. And not only that, wouldn't you do it? But when you came back to fire base, some of these guys, you know, they'd, they'd find, a, particularly down in Kanjuk, they'd find there was always somebody trying to sell you marijuana or something like that, uh, but you just couldn't function like it. Uh, the real drug problem in Vietnam was people in the rear mm -hmm. who had access to it and people trying to get them addicted and the like, and it's no different than what it is today. But to come back to the, to the, to the, to the, to the mood of the country, when, when, we, yes. when, 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 we, when we finally came out, and another thing, uh, Jim, I, uh, uh, I think you previously, before we began this interview, asked me about whether it's worth it or not. Yes. Uh, uh, you know, there ought to be a way to settle disagreements without having to go to war. I don't care where it is. I don't care if it's in the Middle East right now and the thing. It's, it's kind of difficult to judge the Vietnam War. I, I read a book by Michael Lynn called Vietnam, The Necessary War. Michael Lynn's no conservative. And he explained it in terms that it was a, another hot spot in the conflict that they truly believed that that was a, a, uh, a, a, uh, 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 another conflict between the communist and the free, the free world. And we now trade with Vietnam today and the Chinese, but if we hadn't done that, you know, would Vietnam be the country it is today or would it be under the influence? They almost, they almost had to like stand up and become their own country. And they're, you know, and believe me, the communists were no, you know, I, I've given you some examples of the viciousness that they had. And I mean, really vicious thing they had. And Ho Chi Minh was nobody's uncle. You know, he killed, he killed people right and left. That, that's just the way these communist regimes are. And I, I once told someone, I said, you know, well, what's going to happen with uh, China? And I said, well, the Chinese live longer than the Russians. It finally took the Russians until 1989 to finally crumble. And once you, once you become global the way we are, uh, these, these things go away as far as nationalism is concerned. What's going on now in the conflict in the Middle East, that's as much to do with religion as anything and settling old scores. That's almost like tribal warfare. Sure. Where, where countries like that all of a sudden, you know, you know, it was just a matter of time with TV and electronics and the like that, you know, Russia was going to fall. And, and look at Vietnam now. 
you know, they partner with Japan right off the bat and with us now. We're, we're trading partners and the like, and the lives are better off uh, for everyone. Uh, I have no desire, I know friends of mine have gone back to, uh, as I'm in a Pat now lives there, I have no desire to go back to Vietnam. It would just bring back, I think, horrible memories from me. Uh, and there, uh, Thailand, I'd probably go back to Thailand. I have fond memories of that. Uh, but uh, it's, you know, was it worth it? No, of course it's not. I think we all know that. It wasn't worth the lives that, that of Americans were killed, Australians that were killed, North, uh, South Koreans that were killed, or other allies that were killed, and certainly the Vietnamese people have suffered mightily as a result of it. There should have been a better way to resolve that conflict, whether politically or not. And you didn't have to be on the ground there very long to realize. Just like I told you about the old man, you know, this is a very poor country. Just go away. And he was, and the, and the, and the, and the logic was on the other side, not ours. And it was going to be, it was going to happen inevitably anyway. And I, you know, uh, and it just how many times we're going to make the mistake when we're going to learn a lesson, I don't know. But I think that that's the way we do it. One thing we can be really proud of is the military really got bashed during that period of time. Mm -hmm. And all of us saw things and what, uh, you know, Cal Lieutenant Cowley became the face of the war, unfortunately, for us. And really how, how much good we did. Uh, we all went out on, on projects to, while we were there, uh, when you'd come back to, to help build a little school or build a little village. We weren't always destroying things, we were helping to build things as well and trying to make the South Vietnamese a free people and to give them the independence and the right to do that. It's just that they weren't, they weren't gonna, it wasn't, it wasn't gonna happen. There was a lot of bad in that war, there was some good, but I think the final judgment will be made sometime well in the future. We can say now that, yeah, you know, it was probably a mistake to escalate, become involved in a war the way that we, the way that we, the way that we did. And, uh, you know, the, like I said, we owe, my generation owes an obligation to those who didn't come back, whether you went to that war or not, to do what's right and to make sure that if we do send our military to fight, that it's the best, the finest, and the brightest, and they're there for the right reason, to do the right thing. Thank you very much. Right. In the interest of concluding this interview, I'd like to say something you've heard many, many times. Very simply, thank you from a very grateful nation. And more importantly, thank you for your continued service to the country by helping these vets. Thank you. Thank you. All right.